Well, welcome to the Global Math Department, everyone. My name is Lee Natero, and I'll be your host tonight. Tonight, we're going to be hearing from Peter Liliadal. Before we begin our session, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Global Math Department. The Global Math Department is an organization that is run entirely by volunteers. We have been leading free math PD webinars since 2012. But sadly, the Global Math Department will be closing up shop at the end of this season. And so tonight's session is our penultimate webinar. Before uh, I turn this webinar over to Peter for our discussion here, um, I'm going to explain a little bit about how our webinars work. Our webinars are recorded and are available about 24 hours after the meeting ends. To view the recording, you could use the same URL you used to get here tonight. The Global Math Department community prides itself on being friendly and supportive. The chat room is available for topical and general conversation throughout the meeting. And if the chatter gets busy, I'll be sure to catch your questions for Peter to be uh, addressed during our presentation. If you haven't already done so, please introduce yourself in the chat, telling us what you teach, where you teach, and what your Twitter handle is if you have one. I see many people have already been introducing themselves in the chat, and it looks like we've got people from not just the United States and Canada, but all, all over the world. We thank you for being here. So our speaker tonight is Peter Liliadal, and he's going to be sharing on the topic, Building Thinking Classrooms Six Years Later. Dr. Peter Liliadal is a professor of mathematics education in the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University. And he is the author of the best-selling book, Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics, Grades K-12, to 14 Teaching Practices for Enhancing Learning. Peter is a former high school mathematics teacher who has kept his research interest and activities close to the classroom. He consults regularly with teachers, schools, school districts, and ministries of education on issues of teaching and learning, problem solving, assessment, numeracy, and building thinking classrooms. And so tonight's webinar session is a little bit different. Uh, Peter is not going to be uh, giving us a presentation. It's going to be an interview. So many of you have already submitted questions, and I will be uh, sharing those questions. I know there's also some questions people have posted in the Q&A, and if we have time, we'll get to those as well. So first of all, Peter, um, what has changed with building thinking classrooms since you gave your first Global Math Department presentation um, a little over um, six years ago on March 14th, 2017. Okay, well, first of all, thanks for having me back. Um, and I think I share the sentiment with so many people in the chat that it's sad to see this go, but you know, times change and I understand and volunteerism is difficult. Um, I will, uh, before, before I say what's changed, the first thing I wanna say is, the Global Math Department was the first time I did a digital presentation on building thinking classrooms. And uh, when I did that back in 2017, and um, it was sort of a surreal experience to have that opportunity to present to and beyond the people that were in the room with me. And, you know, this was, this was quite different for me. COVID changed that. That has now become quite normal for me. I've done a lot of these types of recordings and podcasts and so on and so forth, but it was, it was really at the time and still is hugely monumental for me to have been a guest on this, uh, let's call it show, uh, six years ago. And I think it allowed building thinking classrooms to move out of that sphere, that very tight sphere of people that I was working with uh, and out into, into the global math sphere. Uh, and I can trace back some really interesting relationships that have come out of that and, and so on, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into that. Um, what has changed? A lot has changed, right? So the book has been published um, and the book had to be finished. The book hadn't even been started at this point. In fact, it wasn't even a plan. And, um, and the Global Math Department, in many ways, that presentation uh, led to me connecting with my editor, Aaron Null, and, and us sort of thinking about what a book could look like. Um, so... What has changed in terms of the research is I was looking, I'm looking at the presentation I gave six years ago here and wow, a lot of things have changed. So first of all, back then there was only 11 practices. There's now 14. Um, 
So that was a that was interesting for me because I knew that there had been 11 practices, but I thought I'd already transitioned to 14 practices by the time I gave this presentation six years ago. Um, part of it was a natural transition in that I'm looking at it now and assessment was all bundled inside of one practice and that had to be expanded out into three separate practices and its own toolkit. Um, the other thing that was missed, what's interesting is homework was not in the practices that um, was in the building thinking classroom framework back then. We were still experimenting with that and playing with it. And, and it was just coming to refinement at that time. Uh, it was a tough nut to crack. Um, in the end, it turned out not to be tough once we found the right approach to sort of a, to get to it. But that's the first thing that has changed is that there are there's that additional practice assessment has expanded out into its own toolkit and this is all based on the empirical data that was still trickling in at that time around how to organize the presentations um, or yeah the presentation of these practices into these toolkits for implementation um, when i look at each of the individual practices that i talk about i can sh i can see that there are things that have changed within those as well uh, in particular, there's been a lot of advancements around homework and notes, uh, even as late as the last six, six months. Um, there's been a lot of changes and advancements since the book was published. So those are some interesting things. And I've been personally playing with a lot of these in classrooms of late, um, experimenting specifically around not homework, but check your understanding questions and how we can have students engage in meaningful note making, both individually and collaboratively in using frameworks and structures that are not presented in the book. I was I was happy with what we came to by the time the book was published, but I've continued to work on that and push at that. Um, and it's quite interesting, some of the results that are coming out of that. Uh, another big change is consolidation. So consolidation, practice 10 is, uh, you know, an incredibly complex and nuanced practice. Um, all of the research was there, but the messaging was so confusing when I look back on that time. Because I was teeing off of the Alan Schoenfeld's labeling of leveling to the top and thinking about consolidation as that we were finding was working more effectively as the sort of the antithesis of that, of leveling from the bottom. But it, it was so incredibly complex to explain what was meant by leveling and having to go into the history of that and so on. So really just changing the messaging of it. All the research was the same, but changing that messaging from leveling to the bottom to consolidation from the bottom as a more clear way of communicating what the data and the practices were telling us. And I think that... I think that's part, part of the thing that's important in the change too. It's not just what the data is telling us, what the practices that are effective, but how I can message and communicate those practices in more effective ways so teachers can, can pick them up. Can you, um, first of all, remind our participants here uh, where they can find some information about the changes that you're uh, mentioning? Um, okay, so, ha, so, there is a Building Thinking Classroom Facebook group and the main group, I did a Q&A session with them some time ago where I talk about some of the innovations around both um, meaningful notes and check your understanding questions. And that, that was a recorded session very much like this as an interview and people can get that recording from that, from that group. Um, but it's changed even since then. And you can't get it anywhere yet because I haven't talked about it in, in this sort of a forum as of yet. Um, and it's not that saying that change is like it's out with the old. That's it. We're, 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 we're revising and anything I said before is invalid. It's absolutely not true. It's just these very small refinements that are happening. What, we, what we, I would refer to as micro moves that are make that are refining some of these ideas even more and more and more. Okay. Um, specifically in regards to, I guess it's the homework or check your understanding um, and then notes. Uh, do you want to talk about either of those 
briefly? Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. Okay. So some of you have heard, some people have heard me talk about how, uh, so first of all, in let's take homework first. Homework, isn't it awesome? Like it works so well just as is. We, we, I don't know why I even bothered trying to tackle that one. But, and of course I'm being facetious. We know that homework is a tough, tough sort of practice in general. And almost every teacher I, I work with, I always say, so how's homework going? And they're just, they roll their eyes and they're like, Phew. right? Like it's, it's never actually achieving what it is we wanted to achieve. And, and it's like, who does their homework? Well, it's the kids who don't need to do their homework, do their homework and so on and so forth. Um, and I think part of the reason that it's such a, that our data actually revealed, one of the reasons that homework is such a complex space to engage in is because it turns out that the disconnect between the goals of teachers and the goals of students is greatest in and around homework of anything else we do in the math classroom. Um, like when I interview teachers and I say, so so, how's, how's homework going? They're like, oh, it's not working. So, okay, so why do you keep doing it? What is it that you hope to get out of it? And, you know, they'll say things like, well, parents like in, in, in department policy and like, yeah, okay, let's get past all that. And let's, let's move past all that. And let's just really zero in and focus in on what is it that you as a teacher want to get out of homework? And when I push past all of those sort of things that, that are sort of cultural norms around why we do it, um, teachers tend to say one of three things, right? They say, I want homework to be a safe place for students to make mistakes and learn from their mistakes. Yeah, that's a great answer, I want that too. Or they'll say, I want homework to be a way for students to check to see if they can do on their own what they were able to do in groups in, in, during the class. Great answer, I want that too. Or they'll say, I want homework to be a way for students to check their understanding, a sort of self-assessment. I want that too. Right? These are three really good reasons why we want homework to, to function well for us. I interview students and not a single student says homework is a safe place to make mistakes and learn from my, my mistakes. Not one. Nobody says that. Nobody says homework is the way for me to check to see if. Nobody says that. Number one reason students do homework, it's for marks or grades. Number two reason, my one of my parents or guardians makes me do it. Number three reason, the teacher makes me do it. That like the disconnect between the goals of the teacher and the goals of the students is just so absolutely massive. And so the first shift we made around homework, which happened after I did the first global math department, was um, to shift away, like to rebrand it. Homework just comes with so much baggage. So does practice exercises. All of these things come with a, a certain preconceived notion as to what it is meant to achieve. Um, so we rebranded it to check your understanding questions and we stopped assigning it and we gave students opportunities and, and so on and so forth. And that's sort of where it was when the book was published. There was a, a few more nuances to it. Since then, what we've discovered is that when we cluster homework questions, check your understanding questions into three categories and we label them mild, medium, spicy. And I've talked about that in other forums before. We, we cluster them into these three categories. So we'll put up on the board like three questions and we label them mild. And three questions we label them medium and three questions we label them spicy. And then we say to students, here's the latest nuance on this. We don't say which ones are you going to do. We don't say choose which ones you want to do. What we say is where we're going to start. And Talk about small things that make big differences. I have literally been in classrooms, 18 classrooms in the last four weeks doing this. And it is absolutely transformative what we see the kids do. We sit them down with 15 minutes left in the lesson and we say, I've put some questions up on the board. There's mild, there's medium, there's spicy. Where are you going to start? And some of the stories we see happening in front of our eyes as grade six students, grade nine students, grade 10 students, like every single student in the room is sitting down with excitement and starting and they're picking somewhere to go. And then when they, when they, when they finish, the first thing you say is, so what are you going to do next? And they're like, well, I'm going to medium. 
or listening to students say things like, there's only 10 minutes left. I think, I think we should do one mild, one medium, and then we'll go straight to spicy. You know, stories where kids are, no, I don't want to leave. I don't want to go to science. Promise me you'll leave these questions up. <laughs> and having to kick kids out at five minutes into the lunch hour on the condition. Like, it's, it's so incredibly transformative compared to what we see when we called it homework and we assigned it and we sent it home and we marked it. And I think this is what I love about the work that I do is that I get to spend so many times, so much time experimenting with teachers and find these little nuggets, these little like seemingly inconsequential shifts and have it watch it make such a huge difference. And I'll give you an example of small inconsequential, seemingly inconsequential shifts. I had an opportunity some weeks ago to teach two grade six math lessons back to back. Same lesson, but in two different classrooms in the same building. They were actually side by side. So went in, taught the first lesson. It was a co-teaching situation. We did the lesson. Um, I put up some mild, medium, spicy. The students had never seen this before. And I said, where are you going to start? And right away, the teacher says, this is your exit ticket. <laughs> and then we go into the next classroom and we do the exact same lesson. Different teacher, different kids, but same demographic. And I say, we, I've put up some mild, medium, spicy. Where are you going to start? The teacher doesn't say this is your exit ticket. In the first lesson, we had seven students who did exactly one question, and we couldn't get them to do more. And I asked them why. They, their answer was very simple. This gets me out the door. In the second lesson, that was the lesson where we had to like kick the students out five minutes into lunch, and they would only go on the condition that the questions would still be there when they came back. Hmm. And these are, these are truthful stories. Um, why is that small little thing making such a big difference? And I think it speaks to, in a very small way, the, the shift that we're seeing in a bigger way. What it's doing is highlighting the difference between um, um, responsibility and accountability, right? When we make this thing, account when we make the students accountable to us for it, what we see is what we saw in that first lesson, that they're just going to do the minimum that's necessary. Not everybody. There were students who were working their tails off on that. But when we made it something that they had the opportunity to be responsible for, we saw just such a huge shift in what it was they were doing with pride. I was in a grade four classroom three weeks ago where I put up three questions of mild, three questions of medium, three questions of spicy. And then the students are going like, can, can we have some more spicy? And I'm like, okay, and I'm writing up more questions. I had the, these kids were following me with clipboards and sitting trying to look around me as I'm putting these questions up. And it just, it's these little things that just have made such huge differences in students' experiences. Wow, that's wow. amazing. <laughs> I can definitely see how calling an exit ticket, you might think, okay, this has specific meaning, but the students see it as, yeah, their way to get out the door, right? Yeah. Which is really not what we want them to be thinking of math as something just they have to do. You know, we, we hopefully want to make these changes so that they want to do it, right? That they really yeah. want to. And they so, do. And I think the labeling makes a difference. Oh, it's not my labeling. I don't lay any claim to it. I've, I've picked it up in the ether and it's been around for a long time. But just making that shift and paying attention to what a difference it makes. And I think one of the reasons it makes a difference is because it's very non-judgmental. Mild, medium, spicy is about preference. I like that. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, at, at one time I was a department chair and how I would have tried to approach this with my faculty, you know, the, the teachers. Um, yeah because sometimes that can be a challenging uh, situation, um, you know, especially when people like their exit tickets and people like doing things a certain way. Um, so what are some recommendations you have for leaders uh, in terms of helping to model and transform, uh, you know, help, help teachers transform their classrooms with building thinking classrooms? Oh, okay. Um... 
Okay, so great question, by the way. Um, so there's a whole bunch of ways I can come at this, but let, let me start at it from the perspective of the teacher first and then the perspective of the leader. So one of the things that I think is really, really important is teachers' professional autonomy. Um, and that we have to view teachers as professionals. You know, they, they've been trained, they've been educated, they have credentials, they have experience. These are highly trained, highly educated uh, people working in a profession that they have clearly have a passion for. Because, you know, working in a school with kids is not the place to be if you don't have a passion for that kind of work. Um, and that professional autonomy means that we have to accept the fact that some teachers are not necessarily going to want to do exactly what it is we want to do. Um, and I'm willing to accept that, right? I may have opinions about this and I may believe that what they're doing is less effective, but we also have to respect that teacher's willing, professional autonomy. Now, that's not to say that I may not have things I want to say to that teacher to try to help convince them, but I certainly don't want to be put into a position where I'm mandating that somebody has to do something different. And that's what I appreciate about this question, because it's not about what can we tell leaders to make teachers do something. It's what can we tell leaders, what can I say to leaders that can help them help teachers make this shift? Um, so I've been doing some work on this, right? Like there is a parallel to building thinking classrooms, which is sort of this parallel around teacher education around how do we work with teachers in a professional learning situation, whether that's a pre-service teacher at the university, an in-service teacher engaged in um, some graduate work, an in-service teacher in a workshop, however it is, how do we work with these teachers and so on. And one of the things that I have come to understand about this work is that number one, I cannot change a teacher, right? I, only a teacher can change themselves. Number two, there is an art and craft to teaching, right? But just as there's an art and craft to teaching, there's an art and craft to working with teachers. And we can do a good job of it. And we can do a bad job of it. Uh, number three, um, just like we know that students don't best learn by simply being told how to do it, we have to like if we're willing to accept that premise, we have to also accept the premise that teachers don't best learn how to teach by simply being told how to do it, right? There has to be an experiential component to it. We, we want our students to construct understanding, make meaning through rich experiences around what it means to learn mathematics. I would argue that this exact same thing is true for any teacher who's aiming to move themselves along a professional continuum, that they have to be able to have opportunities to construct meaningful, uh, make, construct meaning in meaningful situations where they are collaborating and having rich experiences. Um, number four, um, every teacher who is in the process of change is either moving towards something or away from something. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's what that that def kind of defines change. Staying still means you're you're not changing. But if you are in change, you are moving towards something, something that you've seen that you like. I've seen my neighboring teacher do this. I really like it. Or I've seen my my coach or my consultant came in and did something with the kids. I really liked what I saw. And now I want to move towards that or move away from something that I don't like. Right. I don't like what's happening in my classroom right now. I don't like the fact that my students skip school or I don't like the fact that they're inattentive there has to be and the thing and that's number five the thing that they are moving towards or moving away from is something that they have to notice and this sort of encapsulates the work of us who operate in these leadership capacities when we're working with teachers is fundamentally I can't change a teacher I have to accept the fact that I can't tell a teacher what's best like what I like I have to give them ex rich experiences and I have to help them to notice the things that they want to move away from or towards, right? So if I work with a teacher, what I'm trying to do is, is, is shift their attention towards things that they can notice. And I think this is the professional work. Now, there are some really practical things that we can use when we work with our colleagues, especially when we're working side by side or in spaces where 
we are equals, which is almost always true. Um, I always tell people in this position to use the word I a lot. Use the word I. This is what I am doing. This is what I am seeing. This is why I am doing it. This is what my students are showing me. This is what's happening in my classroom. So we're using I and my. And what we want to do is we want to use this as a way to shift attention for, for someone else so that they can start to notice things within us. And I think that there's much more inviting and much more effective to invite someone into the I space, my space, than it is to push into their space, mm -hmm. right? Because once we start using the word you, we start to really, it starts to feel like a lot of judgment, right? So I think the, the, the main advice I give with, to people who work in these capacities is use the word I a lot. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I'll have to go back and watch this recording later to make sure I jot down all of those uh, ideas that you enumerated. Oh gosh, um, let's move into some questions uh, specifically related to implement implementing uh, building thinking classrooms. Um, so um, one of the questions that somebody has this came from uh, Carla Bandemer. Um, she said she's curious to know. Um, how you stay mindful as you're circulating to different groups, you know, like, um, you know, she's so, she's so concerned about spending too much time, maybe at a certain group. And then also curious about how you plan uh, for a task. So like okay. how you feel about that process. Oh, there's two really easy questions. Um, I'll take the first one. That one's actually the mindfulness one. Um, okay. So, how can we mindful when we interact with a group? So, and not just, and so the first question is, what do we want to be mindful? Right. One is, what is their conversation currently about? Where are they right now as learners? And how can I aid them or extend them from where they currently are? And that's a different question than how do I extend or, or aid them to go in the direction where I want them to go in, right? Like it's what is the natural extension where they are in their thinking right now? And what is the natural hint for what their thinking is right now? Um, so that is, that is one thing to be mindful of. The second thing is to be mindful of is does this group actually need my intervention right now? Like, am I just stopping by because I like the sound of my own voice or because they just happen to be the next group in my journey around the room? Because I have better things to do than to step in and interfere with their thinking. So it is one of the things that's really, really important to be mindful of is, is it really needed for me to step in at this point? Um, another thing to be mindful of is if I am going to step in, what is it I'm going to say? And become clear about that before I step in. Now, we can't be 100% clear because I may need to ask a question in order to understand what's going on in a better way. But have a plan. Like, don't step in there, just a blank slate. And then, because what you're going to find is you're going to end up being there too long. Um, and then be mindful of how long you're going to be there. So, so these are the things we need to be mindful of, right? So how do we stay mindful when we're doing this is... I think the most important thing to ask yourself is, does this group really need me? And if not, where's a group that does need me? And, and to stop pushing into these spaces when the kids don't need us, because we're just derailing them and disrupting them. Uh, and the second thing is, when we do step into those spaces, think about it from the perspective that I'm entering a conversation that they've already started. You're at a dinner party, you're at a social event, and, you st and you're and there's a group of people that are talking and then you kind of enter that group, you're not going to come storming in with, let me tell you about what happened yesterday, right? You're going to, you're going to listen. You're going to enter into that conversation. You're going to try to naturally fit into that conversation with the same thing is true when we're, when we're working with students, right? They've already started this conversation. We're entering into their conversation, right? It's not our conversation. So just be mindful of that. And that helps us to be aware of, of, of the fact that we need to listen. We need to listen more than we talk. Mm -hmm. And then be really mindful of how long you're there because the longer you're there, the worse it is. I tell <laughs> teachers that you got 10 seconds. 
like you can you can stand back and watch and listen and plan as long as you want. But the minute you enter that group, you have 10 seconds. Now they'll take 14 seconds. But if I tell them they got 20 seconds, it take a minute 40. And then what's going on behind the view is like there's mayhem. Kids are off task and so on and so forth. And, and then we we can't help ourselves. We have we know so much and we start talking and we start helping more and so on and so forth. So I think those are some things that are important for being mindful. Yeah, those, those are great suggestions. Um, there was also, I guess, planning ahead for the task. So as you as you pick a task that you're doing, um, what are some things that you do to plan for that task? Yeah. So it depends on what kind of task it is. Let's say it's a non-curricular task. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, I'm picking a task that I think has some rich potential, right? Now I may not actually know it has rich potential because I haven't used it yet. And the fact that I can solve it in an interesting way doesn't necessarily mean it has rich potential. Rich potential comes from the fact that a group of students are going to engage with this. They're going to, they're gonna, they're gonna get stuck and they're gonna have to think and they're gonna have to use innovative ways to solve it. So that's, that's where that rich potential is. Now, starting with a task that has rich potential is often not the right place to enter the task. Right? The way the task comes to you is, is, is rarely the way we should just start. What we need to do is we need to figure out how can I A, introduce this task, but how can I back this task up? Right? How can I back this task up so that everybody can enter into it? Which means that maybe this task, I'll give you a perfect example about this. Um, there's this task that I found in this old, old problem solving book. Um, and it's like an incredibly complex task. It's this task where there are 13 people in a room and they're all friends. And the first person, everybody takes out how much money they have on and puts it on the table in front of them. And then the, and the first person go, picks up their money and they double up everybody else that's in the room. Somebody has $40 in front of them, they double them up $80. Someone has $12, double them up to $24. And they do this until everybody's been doubled up. And whatever they got left, they put down. And then person number two picks up their money and they double up everybody in the room and put whatever they have left down the table, and so on and so forth. And then at the end, when all 13 have done it, everybody has the same amount of money. How much money did they all have? start with like okay this seems like a really interesting task i never thought of something like, my gosh like we're starting with a high ceiling so my question is how do i back this up how do i how do i reduce the complex task so that everyone can enter and it's like oh well let me tell you about this story uh i was visiting london uh, which is where I happen to be today, London, Ontario, not London, England. And and I got to visit with my friend Trish, which I did today. And uh, Trish always worries about me when I come to London. And she says, Peter, you know, London, we're not like the rest of Canada. We're, not, we're a cash society here. I can't let you walk around London without any cash in your wallet. So uh, show me how much cash you have. And then I open up my wallet and she see, I said, you know what? That's not enough. I'm going to double you up. She doubles me up and then I, now I feel guilty. So I'm like, okay, so, well, now I feel bad. So how much money do you have now? And then she shows me and I said, well, I'm going to double you up. And now we have the same amount of money. And now I've, I've backed this task up to a point where I think more students can enter it. And now we can move forward. What if there was three people? What if there was four? What if there was five? So the first thing I always do when I face a task, that's a non-curricular task is I ask myself, is the floor sufficiently low for everyone to start. I can always go up. Once we're started, I can always go up. But how can I lower the floor enough so that everyone can start? Everyone can understand what the instructions are. They can get comfortable and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a really important thing. The second thing that I really do when I, when I plan to use a task like this is I just start paying very close attention to how the students are, are, are entering and what they're doing first. 
Me having one solution for the task is relatively unimportant compared to the five or six different ways that I'm going to see students. And I have to be ready for that. And by being ready for that, I don't mean I have to scour this task and try to find five or six different ways to solve it. It just means I need to be attentive to what the students are doing when they're in the classroom. Like where, which directions are they going with this so that I can enter into those conversations? And the first time I use a task, I'm going to learn a whole bunch of things about this task. And it's going to make it even better the second time I use it, but not nearly as good as the third. Right. And every time I use the task, I get to know more about the way students think about it and the different possible solutions and so on. And none of that is possible if I just sit at a desk and try to prepare myself on my own. The way we prepare for a task is we use a task, but then we pay attention to what happens. No, I like how you definitely described uh, bringing that task down so that the students could understand it. Um, sometimes it's hard to think about how to do that, <laughs> but I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure you can get better with practice. Um, oh, yeah. For sure. Um, I have um, another question here related to um, implementing building thinking classrooms. This one comes from uh, Donald DeLand. Um, and he uh, says, thin slicing is great for building basic skills, but at some point students need to be exposed to complex problems and learn and practice how to break them down, um, especially for problems that do not have closed form solutions. So do you have any thoughts about good ways for introducing and transitioning to complex problem solving? So that's sort of ironic given that what we just talked about, because um, in a thinking classroom, we actually start with the complex problem solving, right? Like this is where we start. We start with non-curricular rich tasks that require uh, non-linear ways of thinking, often non-closed form answers. Uh, if they're not, if they're not open-ended, they're certainly open in the middle. Um, and that's where we start. And that's where we build their comfort and their, their, their capabilities. Thin slicing is a particular subset of, of the way we move through curricular content where students are co constructing understanding through um, re repeated experiences with gradually increasing complexity. And not just gradually increasing complexity, but with sl very slight variations so that they can start to notice things because we notice change against a backdrop of consistency and so on and so forth. So it's, I'm getting pretty technical there, but, but it's, it's very effective for having students make meaning of even complex things. Now, what I think he's talking about is when we get into two things. One is authentic problem solving tasks and where we're dealing with maybe real world phenomena with non-closed form answers, where there's actually multiple solutions, um, which rarely we do. We rarely engage in those truly authentic real world problems. Um, we engage in real-ish world problems. Um, oh, and the second form, which he may be talking about, is when we need to have students prepared to be able to answer the word problems that they're going to encounter on standardized assessments and so on and so forth, which is a huge amount of decoding for these kids. Well, <laughs> how do we thin slice? Like, let's say decoding is the skill we want students to learn. How do we thin slice that? Right? What is the first word problem I can ask students that they can decode? And what's the second one that's slightly harder? And the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one. And we have the students working on, uh, in that and they're trying to they're working collaboratively and the goal is to decode the task not to solve it solving is often relatively simple once the decoding has been done um but to work through that process of noticing very small changes so for example maybe we're using the word more than over and over and over and over again and all of a sudden the word is different they're going to notice that we've shifted that word and then, and so on. And then word, the problems can get more and more complex. We can start adding in distractors and so on and so forth. And we start to build that capacity just like we do any other skill in the context of meaning making within groups. We need to transition it to that individual meaning making uh, through the meaningful consolidation, meaningful notes and check your understanding questions. But as a meaning making, it's really no different. 
Okay. No, that make that makes a lot of sense. As I read that question, I was like, well, we kind of have covered the ideas here a little bit already with that one. Um, uh, so a couple other questions. These are like variations on building thinking classrooms. So um, I know that there's a companion book that you have uh, for mm -hmm. building thinking classrooms um, for virtual classrooms. Um, do you have any uh, big recommendations or takeaways for those teachers that are teaching in virtual classrooms? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so first of all, the companion book is not exclusively about virtual classrooms. It's 12 chapters. Four of the chapters are about virtual classrooms. But there's also chapters about how do we teach in classrooms with small populations, like less than 15 students. It turns out it's different. How do we do homeschooling with the thinking classroom philosophy? How do we work in a resource room in our, or in one of these centers where students are working at a self-paced uh, modality where there, where there may be 20 students in the room, but they're all working on something different. How do we work with small group instruction? How do we work with students who are, have unfinished learning? There's chapters on all of these things. But let's talk about online. Um, and of course, online means actually a whole bunch of different things. Are we talking synchronous or asynchronous? And are we taking, are we talking about uh, blended or fully online. I hope we're talking about fully online. And if we are talking synchronous, there's a lot I can say about that. If we're talking asynchronous, it gets harder. Let's, let's go with so, synchronous. Let's, let's do synchronous. <laughs> yeah. So synchronous online is wow. we can reconstruct and recreate the building thinking classroom experience as long as the students are participating. Um, by having by, by, by just creating proxies for the different things. So I, I prefer using Zoom. Uh, so it has a random generator in it. So there's your random groups. We use Jamboards as our, as our whiteboard, digital whiteboards. We do everything else pretty much the same. There are a few things that have to be different. And one of the things that we learned was that what's missing in the digital environment is this. Which, yeah, I, that wasn't an arbitrary motion. But in a physical classroom, that, uh, that opportunity for students to just look to the side and what a group is doing over there or look over their shoulder doesn't exist within a digital environment because it's harder to look over your shoulder or look to the side. You can flip through the gym or screens or so on. But where can students go to quickly get that knowledge and ability to steal an idea? And to do that, we created a third piece of technology. We call the knowledge feed. It's just, uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah. it's, it's, I've the, tried to create a stable environment. That's all right. The, be the beauty of videos, we can edit out that stuff. <laughs> all right. All right. Do we want to move on to another question or do you want to yeah, I think, try I think that one maybe, again? Maybe that's a, that's a question that's bugging this. Yeah, I well, I know that there was a question somebody had asked in the chat about talk about uh, briefly talking about smaller classroom settings, like 10 to 15 students. Mm. So can you talk a little yeah, bit about that? So that was interesting. Yeah, I often get asked this question about, and I, in fact, I was asked this question today. It says, what, at what number does thinking classroom starts to become problematic? And what's interesting is um, there isn't, really an upper number. Of course, there's an upper number. What capacity can your room actually handle? But the lower number ended up being more problematic for us. And the cutoff seemed to be around 15 people, 15 students. And there are two things that are going on for that reason. What are happening when we got into low numbers? One, the students don't feel like the groups are random anymore. Um, if I'm working in a group of three today, there's a really high probability that at least one of those students is going to be in my group tomorrow. And, and when only when one of them is back in the group, the students start to perceive that they're always in the same group, always with the same students. And it's not true mathematically, but there's that perception that it's not changing. So the way we overcame that is we moved to groups of two. Now, the problem with groups of two is that there isn't enough diversity in groups of two. They run out of ideas pretty quick sometimes. And 
overall, small classrooms have less diversity in them, and we end up with less ideas coming forward. So to overcome that, we did two things. One, we put the groups of two close to each other. And this is an interesting little twist. If I make a group of four, it's a dumpster fire. It never works well. But if I put two groups of two close to each other and they start to talk, that works really well. Um, it's almost like they're entering into that space on their terms rather than being thrust into a group of four. Um, so what that does is it ensures that there's a, there's a diverse richness within that group or between those two groups. There's a, a, enough diversity of ideas. But how do we deal with the diversity of the, the lack of diversity of ideas within the room because we have a small number? And the way we solved that was we would, you know, usually when you have a small number of students, you have extra whiteboards. So we would just randomly go and write things on whiteboards and uh, the, uh, put up some ideas of things that seem to be missing in the room. And then the students start to pick up on these things and they're like, oh, look at that. Oh, let's do that. Let's do a T chart. And it's like they're not at some level, they're not really paying attention to the fact that we're the ones who put it there. But it just becomes we're just seeding the space with ideas that seem to be missing. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, a couple other um, questions here, just related to um, getting buy-in from stakeholders. So I'm thinking parents, administration, um, you know, some people might think that this isn't real teaching, so to speak, um, you know, because real teaching is, looks different oh, yeah. from yeah. their own experience. You know, I, this is not how I learned math. Um, so, what are your what what is it that you do to help bring those stakeholders in? Yeah, okay. So a couple of things. First of all, um, I think anybody who's ever done thinking classrooms for a whole hour and feel like they've done it well will tell you that they are teaching harder and better than they've ever taught previously. Like you have to be on your game in a thinking classroom. There's a lot of moving parts. And it, it demands something different of us, um, but it's so rewarding. It energizes us. It's in a, in a weird way. It's exhausting, but energizing at the same time. Um, but getting back to your question about how do we how do we deal with stakeholders? How do we bring stakeholders on? And first of all, we have to recognize who the stakeholders are in this situation. Okay, so we have parents, we have administrators, we have colleagues, and let's not forget the students because they're actually the biggest stakeholder of all in all of this. Um, and in many ways, some of these things are dealt with in different ways. So let's talk about the students. So the Building Thinking Classroom Framework is 14 practices broken into four toolkits. It's an empirically deduced sequence that we should be using to implement the practices. And I, I've spent a lot of time looking at this sequence, trying to understand what it is. And one thing we learned that I've deduced from this framework, the first toolkit is thinking tasks, random groups, and vertical surfaces. And the data says that we should do all three at the same time. So why are those the three practices that we start with? And I think the reason is that it disarms students. <clears throat> it is, it's, a, it's a radical enough change that... It disrupts a system so that the students don't try to hold that system in place. But at the same time, it's a safe enough and fun enough environment that the students are not alarmed or put off by. Now, I'm talking about generalities. You're still going to have individual students who, do, who are put off by it and so on. But there is something very disarming about those first three practices hitting students all at once. Um, and I think that dis disrupts the norms of the classroom. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, and then sets up a better environment for them to be to be able to adopt to this change. <coughs> Sorry, I think that was it. Um, the second thing we learned about the students is that they really about what it is we're doing. The lesson we learned was that when we talk to them makes a huge difference. And I do talk about this in the book, but we learned that 
Let's take random groups, for example. If we sit the students down and say, listen, there's a, this is what happens when I normally group you. I group you strategically or you self-select groups. And these are some of the things that the research is saying is not good about that. So starting tomorrow, we're going to start doing with random groups. Now, when we talk to the students prior to implementation, and then I interview them afterward, this is what they say. They say, yeah, the teacher wants to try something new and she wants us to be okay with it. Um, the teacher is going to do this random group things and he wants us to behave. That's what they're hearing. What they're hearing is we're asking them for permission. The psychology is fascinating here. Now, what if we implement? What if we launch and we're doing random groups, vertical surfaces, thinking tasks, and then two weeks later, we sit them down and say, hey, listen, let me explain what's going on here. And we talk to them. And then I interview them immediately after. What they say is, huh, that was kind of interesting. It makes a lot of sense. I'd never thought of it. And then I say, well, so what do you think about the teacher sharing with you what they're doing? And I, I think that's cool. I really appreciate hearing about that. What they're not saying is that the teacher wants us to be okay with it. Like they're not hearing us ask for permission. And I think this is a really important part of working with these stakeholders. Do we really want to ask for their permission? Because I'll promise you this, if you ask for it, they have a choice to not give it. And if you want to, if like, imagine suggesting to high school students that random groups is a good idea and asking them what they think about it. <laughs> what do you think they're going to say? They're, no way, right? And then if you're asking for permission, they have a choice to not give it. And the way they don't give it is they either vocalize their objection and one of the things we have to understand is that when we ask people their opinion and then we don't act on their opinion, they're offended by that, right? They're offended when we don't take up the recommendations that they do. And that's true for kids as well. Um, and they can choose to reject our ideas by behaving badly, right? So that's my comment on the stakeholders as, as students. My, my comment on the peers as stakeholders, remember, I what I said earlier, just use the word I a lot. You don't have to be a leader to use the word I. Just talk about you, what you're doing, why you're doing it, what you're seeing, why you're keep doing this. Like talk about yourself. Your, your job is not to win them over. They may have opinions about what it is you're doing. They may have objections about what it is you're doing, but they don't have the authority or the right to tell you what to do. So feel free to share with them. Administrators, it's, it's a good idea to bring them in on the idea. Administrators love things that are, that are, are, are research-based. They love things that have shown improvement. They love seeing things that, that, that are thoughtful and meaningful and intentional. And, and present yourself in that way, right? You're a professional. Present yourself as a professional. This is what I want to do. Now, let's talk about parents because parents are – a really interesting stakeholder group. Um, the first thing I want to say about this, and this is something that I came through came through in the in, in research that's related to thinking classroom, but really just around the fact that I'm working with so many teachers, is that teachers are not afraid of parents. Teachers are afraid of administrators who don't support them in the face of parents. Mm -hmm. There lies the challenge, right? It's not the parent that scares us. It's a fact that if this parent goes above our head, that this administrator is not going to support me in my effort. So having this administrator on board is going to give you the courage to, to talk to a parent with authority and with confidence, right? It's the scary part is when, when you don't know if you have that support. Now, let's think about parents in, in a very particular way. Um, and we'll start people in general, so, or wherever you are, right? I, not, right now I'm in London, Ontario. If I go out onto the mean streets of London, Ontario, and I grab 100 citizens at random and bring them into the ballroom of this hotel and I interview them, how many of them do you think would say they have a negative relationship with mathematics? Right. And, and you can go through this thought experiment wherever you live. How many of those hundred people have a negative experience with mathematics? I'm willing to bet that the number is close to 90. 
90% of people have a negative relationship with mathematics. Um, how many of them are downright terrified of mathematics? And we're probably getting to in the 70% range, right? 70 out of the 100, maybe 75 are terrified of mathematics. Well, those are the parents of your students. And we have to, we have to understand that. That parents are not some special subset of society. They are those same people who have negative relationships with mathematics, who are terrified of mathematics. And now you are doing something that is very unfamiliar to them. And what they worry about the most is what they worry about the most is that something is going to happen to, in school that's going to come home to roost in their house. That this that you're not going to be effective in your job, and now they're going to have to pick up the slack, and that terrifies them because they already have a negative relationship with mathematics, and they're terrified of mathematics. They don't want their child to have that same experience, so they're just hoping that you're going to do a good job. And we have to understand that 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 when a teach when a parent expresses concern, that often the thing that they're saying is not the thing that they're feeling. Right. And this is true, not just of parents, but lots and lots of different people. You were you were uh, you were saying about the parents, you know, basically that that um, what they're saying is not necessarily really what they're meaning and that, you know, their their concern is that they might actually have to teach them some math themselves that they're not uh, really prepared for. <laughs> Thank you, Norma. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 oh my goodness, this was wonderful. And I, I hope he pops back on. Yep. Peter, it's like, Norma says, it's like your, the whiteboard markers that don't work consistently. <laughs> it's yeah. But thank you um, for editing. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we're at the, we're at the one hour mark. Yeah. yeah. You want me to finish off this question? Um, actually, I'm going to ask you one question. Um, what has been most the most surprising thing yeah. about this journey with BTC? Here right now. I think surprise is these ideas, these results that are emerging from my work are being are resonating with so many people. And that and and I, I think that in and of itself is surprising. But I think that what's even more surprising is that I can write these ideas down in a book and people can read them and start acting on them. And that somehow these ideas now have taken on a Yeah, and I don't I don't see Peter on here anymore. So um thank you all for being here tonight. I apologize for the technical difficulties that we had that happened uh partway through the webinar. Uh but uh, we will be we'll posting be the recording. Sorry. Yep. I think we you, you popped out there again for a second. So. Yeah. I apologize. Well, you, do, you, you ask me to do what you want me to do and I'll, I'll finish talking. About yeah. It yeah. I was going to say, you can just wrap up, just wrap up. Okay. Um, here's something that I've really been thinking about a lot lately when I work with teachers is that, one of the one of the things that your previous question, one of the things that's so surprising to me is that building thinking classrooms now lives outside of me, that it lives in a book that people can read and they can start implementing and so on and so forth. But I think that what comes with that is that we need to it needs to also live outside of me in a sense that I can't always be the source of all the answers. And what I encourage teachers to do is to think about building thinking classrooms as a problem for you to solve. It's a problem for you to solve, to work on and to and to tinker with and to play with. And and of course, you want to gather resources and you want to get ideas from everybody else, just like when students are problem solving in groups. And ideally, you would want to be in a group to work together with. But it's a problem to solve. And and you all have the professional capacity to do that. All right. Thank you so much for uh, presenting. Well, it wasn't a presentation. It was just a conversation. So thank you so much. I, yeah, I apologize sure. for the, the difficulty at the end there, but um, I really appreciate that you took the time to have this conversation with us. And um, I know I'm going to be 
starting to be a real advocate for building thinking classrooms. Um, I'm actually going to be working with some pre-service teachers. And so we're going to be looking at your book as one of the resources that we're going to be using. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. We have our final session on May 30th with Howie Wah on finding joy in math. I think it'll be a great way to wrap up the global math department. So I really appreciate everyone for being here and thank you once again, Peter. My pleasure. Apologies for the spotty Wi-Fi here.